talk about the subject of fatherhood. Thank you so much, John. And uh, before we start, I wonder if we could, uh, if I could get you to do a little exercise, okay? I want you to think of, uh, I'm going to call out a few words, and I want you to think of um, words connected with, with what I'm going to say, or images that would come to your mind. Like, for example, I'm, I'm, going to, like, I'm going to put out random words. So, for example, if I gave the word um, carpet, you might think, uh, okay, that's uh, soft, uh, comfortable, um, Australian fella. Uh, <laughs> you might, you might. <laughs> yeah, Aladdin. So, yeah, so words. So, uh, I'm going to call out a few random words. I want you to, to think of connected words. So, um, table. Okay. Sand. Good, good. You're getting there. Football. You should have said Messi. Who said Ronaldo? Put your hand up. <laughs> Was that you, Anna? <laughs> it's really messy. But anyway, uh, okay. Father. Okay, now it's interesting, right? With father, with father, uh, all the other words we'll say were kind of neutral. But with father, when you, when you think of father, different connotations, different words come to mind. And today we're going to look at six different aspects of fatherhood. So um, now there's no way I can cover all the different aspects. And there's lots in the scripture that it talks about uh, us as human fathers, what we can do. But today I'm really going to be looking at the fatherhood of God and how it relates to us. And I'm going to be looking at six different aspects of this. So will you join me? Great. Now we're going to be going all over the place with different, um, with different uh, Bible verses and references. And first of all, I guess with father, it, because it's not a, a neutral word, sometimes we can think of our own father, we can think that maybe he was kind and he was caring, uh, he was strong, uh, uh, helping us. Or we might think of words like he might have been distant or he might have been harsh or he might have been uncaring or absent. And fathers are not perfect. Uh, human fathers are not perfect. Even in the Bible, the, the great example of a father, the, one of the first, uh, Abraham, who was, uh, whenever you come across that word Ab or Abba, like Abijah or Abraham or Abram, it means father of something. And Ab Abraham, father of many nations. But even he is an example, he wasn't perfect. Though he's an example of faith, he was our father in faith, he was an example of what it is to have faith and to trust God. But he also made many mistakes. Um, and I think it's important that with our examples, that we imitate them as they imitate Christ, but where they fail, we don't imitate their failures. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we do, but we don't have to. We're not bound to. If, if your father made mistakes, you're not bound to make the same mistakes. But if your father had good things about him, uh, there's good things that you can imitate and you can practice. So we're going to look at six things about six aspects of, of fatherhood relating to God. So the first one is we're going to look at God's nature. Now, John 4 verse 24 says that God is spirit, okay? And that is the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. So if God is spirit, he's beyond male and female, okay? Uh, he, God is spirit. Um, so he's beyond male and female. Now, we know that man, Adam and Eve, were made in God's image. So there's something of the male and female that speaks of God, something about it. In fact, Jesus once used imagery from motherhood to describe himself in Matthew 23, 37, where uh, he was kind of heartbroken about the city that was rejecting him. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you who have killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. So Jesus here used an example of motherhood uh, to describe um, his heart on this. And we see that the Holy Spirit is often referred to in terms that we imagine uh, or that we, we often associate with motherhood. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, our counselor. Um, like you might be out playing with your dad uh, a game of football or something, but when you fall over on the concrete and cut your knee, who do you call? Mom! <laughs> you run to her, you get the plaster, and you get the cuddles. Um, so, and the Holy Spirit is, is described as our comforter, our counselor, things that we would usually associate with motherhood, not exclusively, uh, but I just want to point that out. But fatherhood is the description that God has used uh, as one of the best ways to describe his nature and his relationship to us. And God has deliberately chosen that in the scriptures for various reasons that we're going to examine today. God uses anthropomorphic terms to help us understand things. So anthropomorphic terms, that's, that's like when uh, you give something that's not human, human um, characteristics. Like, for example, in Disney, when they have a mouse or a, a duck talking. Now, mice and, and ducks, they can't talk, uh, but it's giving them human qualities. And God often speaks to us in human terms that we can understand so that we can grasp what he's about and what he's like. Um, so, for example, in Psalm 103, the famous Psalm, uh, towards the end of it, it says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He's mindful that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like the flower of a field. The wind passes over it. It vanishes and its place remembers it no more. So that's from the end of Psalm 103. And God is saying, just like a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. And isn't it great to know that God deals with us compassionately? Like, yeah, it really is great to know that. So that's the first thing I want us to look at, God's nature. Um, now, the second aspect is, uh, why father? So why father exactly? So let's look into this. What is it about father, the word father, that describes God's relationship with us? Well, traditionally, a father was the one who, number one, had authority over the house and the household. So the father is the authority, okay? And that describes God's, that's the first aspect of, of describing his relationship with us. Um, number two, he is, traditionally again, he was a, the provider for the house. He would go and provide for the household. And God is our provider. Number three, he took the initiative in creating us, our creator. So, um, this is aspects of fatherhood that describe God's relationship to us. Now, for us as humans, uh, our fathers, um, I'll just have a little side look at that for the moment. Um, can anybody remember the Ten Commandments, commandment number five? I'll give you a clue. It says, honor. So, very good. Thanks, Avril. So that you may live long in the land. Uh, honor your father and mother. It's given a promise, you know. If you ever felt... Uh, you know, uh, uh, about your parents. Well, listen, remember to respect them. Uh, there's a blessing that will come back to you. Do honor them. And we need, to, we need to go against culture. I do feel it's an awful thing when our culture starts to um, dishonor old people or disregard them or not value them. How wrong this is. And for us, as our parents get older and 
maybe needy, um, maybe continue to respect them and to honor them. It's a commandment with a blessing attached to it. Now, also, fathers were to, I'm looking at the fourth aspect of um, why God used the word father. Uh, fathers were to teach life skills or how to work to their sons, uh, to their children. Fathers would have taught them the world of men, the world of work, um, how to come along. So, let's say a carpenter, like maybe Joseph, as a father, he would have had young Jesus and maybe his brothers, and he would have been teaching them the skills of how to be a carpenter. And God loves to teach us and to bring us alongside him. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how Paul's relationship to Timothy, uh, Paul, uh, he described himself like a father to, to uh, those he was discipling. And, but I must share with you, I think it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible, and it's from Philippians 2, the very famous, you know, Brian has taught us through the book of Philippians and loved it, and, uh, and Philippians 2, which is that famous chapter, but again, that chapter ends um, in verse 19, it, it says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, this is Paul writing, and he says, I've no one else like him who will show a genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. So, I just find that very sad, that nobody else was really that concerned about their welfare. Everybody was more or less looking out for themselves. And, um, but it's just tremendous when, a, when somebody learns the idea of sacrificial giving, you know. Now, we've all done this in, in some regard, um, but may we do it even more. The idea of giving ourselves away, pouring ourselves out, of thinking, how can I bless others not like, does this meeting suit me? Does this church suit me? Uh, ask not what you can do for your church. Oh, wrong way around. Ask not what your church can do for you. What can you do for your church? <laughs> you see? So, um, so this is a challenge to me, to all of us. What can I do to bless you? Not saying, what can you do to bless me? Um, but again, um, I do value any ideas of barbecues, picnics, etc. <laughs> By all means, feel free to bless me that way. Uh, I do like all that. Okay, so the third aspect I want to look at is a negative one. It's how fatherhood has been undermined in our culture. Uh, fatherhood is now under attack like never before. And I think this is uh, because of four reasons I've looked at. Uh, the first reason is because of the failure of fathers ourselves to take responsibility. Uh, men are particularly called to leadership, particularly. And men very often abdicate, like a king who says, I don't want to be king, abdicates. It's like men are called to a role of leadership and responsibility, and they've abdicated so that's the first problem, I think, with fatherhood being undermined from within, from fathers themselves. Abandoning the spiritual leadership of a home, uh, often to mothers. Um, traditionally, uh, in our country, uh, the men, they might have gone out to work, and then they'd uh, give the pay packet to the wife on a Friday, and then they'd go off to the pub, you see, and leave her to, to form the spiritual formation of the children or, uh, to, or their cares. And really, uh, there was a lot of examples, bad examples, of men just abandoning their responsibility and their role. So number two, then the second problem is again an internal problem. It's where there's been abuse from fathers or lack of involvement. On, uh, with fathers. Fathers who've been abusive is such, such a, a, a barbaric, horrific um, twisting 
and a violation of the trust that God has given men and fathers. And, uh, and this has led to many people recoiling from, from fatherhood and, and, uh, and recoiling from men even. And men who are meant to protect and use their strength to bless and protect and defend instead have sometimes used it to be abusive. And an abusive father and also an uninvolved father, they're both destructive. Okay, the third problem uh, in why fatherhood has been undermined, um, it's from the media and the culture. There's a constant undermining of fatherhood. I think uh, we, we noticed it on a cartoon. It was very cute, uh, Peppa Pig. And now I don't know this very well, but uh, there's a constant phrase that comes up, silly daddy, silly daddy. It's your daddy. You can't take him seriously. You know, seriously. He knows nothing, you know. Silly daddy. But the thing is, you see, that gets in, doesn't it? Daddies are silly. You can't take them seriously, you know. Um, what's that? Oh, is that the same? Oh, yeah. I know, Homer Simpson. That's right, you know. There's an example of fatherhood. There was one time he said, uh, Homer Simpson, just the only quote I have of Homer Simpson's is, he says, English, I don't want to learn English. I'm never going to visit England. <laughs> so, so, so these things are funny. These are, they're funny, but we need to just be aware of the, the kind of negative undercurrent that there is against men. Uh, the fourth problem, then, uh, again in the culture, is the hatred of gender truth from the cancel culture agenda. And there's a constant refrain of toxic masculinity. Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah. Did you ever hear of positive masculinity? You probably haven't heard that phrase. Nobody says that. Isn't that interesting? Constant negative pulling down of men. Um, did you ever hear of positive manliness? Did you ever hear that? On the ads, the adverts? No? Positive manliness, no? <laughs> What's that? Diet Coke. Di Diet Coke? <laughs> Is that positive? Oh, really? <laughs> so there you have it. Um, it seems to be that when I look at the adverts, um, are, uh, you wonder, does our society want a reversal of nature's roles, a, 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 a twisting around of the natural order? Uh, I see uh, adverts of women with power drills and men doing uh, knitting and uh, things like that. And um, I don't know about you, but uh, maybe we should start a men's knitting club. I don't know. Or a women's power drill club. Or I don't, you know? But it's funny, isn't it? There's this constant kind of erosion of what's natural and also what's, what's our strengths. Like, how about, how about this? How about if our society said, let's give men and women roles that are accurate? How about uh, this new phrase that we could use, gender accurate? How about that? Let's do something that's gender accurate. Sometimes there's strengths in the gender, just because it's your gender. You might have strengths in your gender. So, let's move on to number four. Okay, this aspect we're going to look at, approaching God as Father. So, in, in the context of all that we've seen, I think it's important that we redirect our minds as to what the Scripture is saying about God. Well, in... Matthew 6, verses 6 to 15. Uh, now, it's not a template, but it's an example. It's the Lord's Prayer, or what we call the Our Father. Um, or Nahar, Atar Nav, Ganefer Danum, Gadaga Do you remember? We've, we've learned this, Asgelga. And in English, um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, 
I'm after looking at these verses, and I found eight things that this speaks to us about. It says, number one, that God is approachable. God is approachable. We can come to God. He is a father. Like a father, you can come to dad. I'd like to talk about this. He's approachable. Number two, God knows our needs, and he wants us to communicate our needs to him. Number three, he is holy and worthy of respect. Um, I have an example of a judge, a child of a judge, and I'll get back to that, I think, later. But he's holy and worthy of respect. We need to not forget that. Number four, his kingdom and his will are a priority. God's kingdom and his will. The question is, are they your priority? Is God's kingdom your priority? Is God's will your priority? That's a question to ask yourself. Number five, he provides for our needs, material and spiritual. So he gives us this day, our daily bread. We're thankful for that. It's such a good idea to give thanks for the food that we have. We don't take it for granted. Um, but he also provides spiritual, or for our spiritual needs. And our number one need as humans is forgiveness. Do you know the closer you'll get to me, the more you'll need to forgive me. Yeah, that could be true, because I might let you down sometimes, and you might need to forgive me. And, you know, you yourself might need me to forgive you. <laughs> you see, we need forgiveness. And God loves to give us forgiveness. See, that's there in the Lord's Prayer. Number six, as his children and as forgiven people, he wants us to share forgiveness. So if you've been forgiven, don't be sharp and mean with someone else. Forgive them. Has God forgiven you stuff? Yeah? So pass it on. Number uh, seven. Although he is our father, he's not indulgent and he will correct us. God isn't indulgent, and obedience is important to him. God doesn't want us to be bratty, spoiled kids, because that's not pleasant. But he wants us to be kids who are a blessing to him and to other people. Number eight, God is our deliverer from evil. You know, there's such evil around, isn't there? And sometimes it's so disappointing, the evil in ourselves. And it's so distressing, the world around us, you think, where is this going? The great news is that God is our deliverer, and our deliverer will come. He's going to sort it out, and you need to keep that in mind. May he deliver us from evil. Amen. Okay, here's the fifth aspect I'm going to look at. He's a close father and not a distant father. I'd like us to look at that. In Mark 14, verse 36 in his hardest, most difficult moment, Jesus said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. And yet, not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus said this with tears and with great anguish. Um, Abba, it means Papa or Daddy. It's a very close, very intimate term. Um, I know some uh, families and parents uh, allow their kids to call them by their forename, but uh, for me, it's been a precious term that they've uh, been able to call me uh, daddy. In fact, there's only three people on the whole planet who can call me dad. Only three people. And you know, for you, you can call God your dad, your papa. He's that close to you. It's a very intimate term, and it's a privilege. If you're born again, this is a privilege for you to know God as your close and loving Father. Now, if you don't know God this way, please do talk to John or, or Brian afterwards. They'd love to pray with you. Um, but Romans 8, 14 to 16, it also tells us, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves again to fear, but rather the Spirit you received 
brought about your adoption as sons. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, so for me, I've told you this before in my, my testimony, uh, that I was um, an orphan. I was adopted by a family in Cork. And uh, so I now have a new name. I have a new name, a new name that they gave me. And uh, I had a father, and he was a very loving father, I must say. He wasn't perfect, uh, but I, I remember he was a postman for 36 years, my dad, Sean. And um, uh, I remember the, the kind of musty smell in the post, the post van. Uh, I remember uh, walking with him. Uh, I remember the smell of cigarettes. He smoked a lot. <laughs> um, he wasn't a perfect man, uh, but he was a loving father, and uh, I do miss him. But I am glad that I had uh, a father. And for each of us, just like I was adopted into a new family, you also, if you're born again, you're adopted into a new family, the family of God. And God has given you brothers and sisters here around you. So it's a loving family, and you have a loving dad now, just because he's our dad and our Abba, and we're very close to him, I think sometimes we're, we're, we go into two camps of extremes. Um, we can be um, very close, but also very, we could take God for granted. Have you ever done that? We need to be careful not to do that, because although he's our dad and we're very close to him, he's also the Lord of all and deserves our respect. So that's where the example of, um, imagine if you're a girl, you're the daughter of a judge, say a Supreme Court judge. So uh, in, uh, in the morning, you might be at breakfast, hi dad, but imagine then you're in on a court case, you have to, and you're in the middle of the courtroom. Well, you would say, uh, hello, your honor. <laughs> yes, your honor, <laughs> you know, show respect. You would, show you, you would show respect to your father. So we need to know that he's deserving of respect, but he's also our close and intimate father. So you're very good for coming with me on this journey. We're on the last point. The sixth point is that Jesus is the way to the father. So Jesus is everything to us. He's the prince of peace. He's the mighty God. He's the counselor. He's the everlasting father. Now, do you see the overlap in the Trinity? Uh, I'm quoting from Isaiah here. But here we see the count, he, Jesus is called counselor. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is the counselor. He's called everlasting father. Well, we, we know the father is the father. But there's, there's a kind of an overlap in the Trinity that we can't fully understand. Um, but it's wonderful. Jesus has shown us what the father is like. A loving, compassionate, just righteous and close involved father you see when you see jesus you've seen the father jesus is the revelation of the father to us that's what he is his joy and his delight is to present children who will bear god's image to the father my final quote is from hebrews and I've just finished the book of Hebrews. It's from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. It says, In bringing many sons to glory, uh, sorry, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. And so, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, he says, I will put my trust in him. And finally, he says, here I am and the children God has given me. It's such a delight for Jesus to say to the Father, here I am and the children God has given me. You know, the Father has many children around the world, many children around Ireland, people who are genuinely born again of the Spirit, who can say, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, and he is their Father.
It's a joy for me to be with you, my brothers and sisters.